Mange is apparently a real problem for wombats around Victoria, including those in the Wombat State Forest. If untreated, it means the animals can eventually apparently itch to death. I didn't realise that. And some wildlife carers are saying that if we don't tackle the mange problem facing wombats, uh, there is serious threats to the future of the population within the next 50 years. To explain a bit more, Nick Bean is the main management uh, Victoria president. Uh, Nick, good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Steve. Can you first up just explain what mange actually is? Uh, mange is a small mice that um, burrows into the skin um, and then it lays eggs and then the eggs uh, hatch and then the new ones come out and then they also start burrowing into the skin. So it's actually the process of burrowing into the skin that causes open infections and kills off the skin and after a period of maybe 12 months, they die from, if anything, they die from secondary issues, so like uh, septicemia and other infections, unfortunately. Okay, so in, in terms of the prevalence of this with wombat populations, how, how significant is it? Uh, quite significant. So um, you've got examples such as um, there's a park north of, uh, in the northern part of Tasmania called Naratapu National Park, and they've pretty much in the last 10 years lost about 90 Ninety-five percent of their wombats. Um, I was there a few years ago, and there was still about sixty or seventy wombats that we counted. Um, but in the space of just a few years, they're down to about ten now. So, and the mange comes from where? Um, the mange. Well, the mite itself was essentially introduced to this country by early settlers, yep. um, either on themselves, on people. It's known as scabies. So it's actually a human-based disease, if you okay, like. Yep. Um, so it came on early settlers, and um, it just so happens that the burrow for a wombat, which is often shared with foxes in some cases, um, is a perfect um, habitat for the mite to um, to breed, basically. So between early settlers and then foxes, and that's how it gets into the wombat population? Uh, well, it's mainly um, the burrow environment is a perfect breeding ground. So yep. whether it's a wombat or a fox, it's kind of... Um, foxes don't... Um, some people might claim that foxes uh, transmit mange. They do, but they're not the cause of it, if you like. Yeah. So it came with early humans. Yeah. Okay. So in in terms of, uh, say, the Wombat State Forest, what do you know about the the numbers of animals there affected with mange? Um, I must admit, I don't know. I can't say off the top of my head, but um, on average, we're looking at about oh, probably 20 25% or more on average uh, wombats having mange. And from your description of what happened in that other national park, it can actually transmit and travel across the population relatively quickly. Yes, yes. So under certain circumstances, which we don't quite understand, it can just um, kick off and uh, become a real killer, unfortunately. So how do you treat it, uh, particularly with a wild population? What do you do? Um, the way we tackle it is through two methods. Uh, we either... So if I go to a property and I find a wombat out, I, I'll use a technique called pole and scoop if I can, and I'll use a solution called cydectin, which is quite common in the farming um, communities yeah. for treating uh, a whole range of things. But it just so happens that cydectin works extremely well at killing mange. Um, so basically you can splash the solution on the back of the neck or the back of the body, and it's a bit like using frontline for dogs. It gets into the bloodstream. It kills the mange bite within 24 hours, essentially. Mm. Um, and it lasts for two, maybe three weeks uh, between doses. Um, but we like to do a regular dose about every week for about um, four to six weeks, either through pollen scoop or we use a thing called a burrow flap, which is a, a plastic ice cream container hung over the front of the burrow, and as they push through, they splash the solution onto the back of their neck. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, so it's as, as the wombats are going in and out, this is happening. So how, how long yes. do the mites last in the burrow? Um, well, uh, they can live... Well, basically, the, the life cycle of the main mite is about four weeks, um, and they can live off host for a week, maybe two weeks in the burrow. So um, if we repeat this process for, say, four to six, maybe eight weeks in some cases, you're going to do two things. You'll kill the mange on the actual animal and the burrow itself will become sort of mange-free, basically. Mm. 
So, okay, and the next thing you, I, by the sound of what you've said earlier, that you've got to control is the fox population somehow, because if you go through all this process and get the, the wombats free of mange, then, and the foxes yep. are still around, you've still got a problem. That's true, yes. So the foxes are a, a secondary issue which needs to be dealt with, but um, to me, treating the mange is kind of a priority, so... Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the thing about foxes is you have to look at um, Tasmania and they don't really have, or they don't have foxes, mm. and yet they still have a tremendous mange problem. So, um, yeah. So, okay, from this disease, what's the future look like for wombats unless we actually, unless we really get on top of this? Uh, it's looking a bit bleak because between roadkill um, land changes, if you like, and um, the drying of the landscape perhaps and um, mange, uh, they're not looking um, too good, unfortunately. Uh, wombats are only, they don't breed, they breed, but they don't have a lot of young. So they don't have um, huge numbers to start with, I'm afraid. Mm. So it's not looking positive from their landscape anyway. So how much time do we have then? Um, well, if we don't do anything, you're probably looking anywhere between next 30 to 50 years where you're going to have such reduced numbers it will be uh, an issue from the, you know, the gene pool if you like. So there won't be enough effectively to, to breed up successfully and re-establish yeah. the population even if in 50 years we got on top of it? Yeah and if you look across the state of Victoria for example um, they're predominantly in the northeast part of Victoria or the eastern side. Mm. Uh, once you go to the west there's only a small pocket down near um, uh, Port Campbell way, I think it is, or yep. down that way. Uh, and then you also get a different um, subspecies once you get into South Australia as well. So um, the numbers are kind of on the small side, unfortunately. Yeah. Can I ask, Nick, how, how did you get involved in this? This, this is, uh, it's not a, yeah. not a usual area of interest, if I can just put it that way. No, well, it was about three or four years ago. I was heading off on a bike ride on, I remember it was Australia Day, at about 7 o'clock in the morning. But I'd only gone about a kilometre up the road and a car had stopped and in front of it was a, a black mass ambling across the road and I knew it was a wombat, probably with mange, because it was about 25 degrees by then. I thought it was kind of warm. Mm. Um, and I rode up and um, got off the bike and um, found the wombat in the paddock and um, decided that I've got to do something. I can't just let these things continue. And... Um, here I was standing in the middle of a paddock with my life crew being attacked by a wombat, basically. <laughs> and just kept jumping up a leg. <laughs> so um, I thought, you've got a bit of life about you. I'm happy to give you, a, you know, a chance. So I contacted a local wildlife carer and she, um, she came down with the cytectin and we dosed it. And um, we also use a solution called chloramide, which is a, a, a fly or insect repellent with mm. uh, a healing property about it. So we sprayed some of that on, and um, that became my first wombat called Curly, and he survived for, um, well, we, we saw him a few months later, and it looked uh, much better, actually. Okay. So, so we kept treating, I must admit, though. We kept treating for about three, um, three or four weeks, anyway. Okay. So so had you had any wildlife training? Are you Do you have a, an environmental science degree or anything, Nick, or it was just that you saw that and you were fascinated by it? Uh, yeah, the latter. I... I have no formal training. Um, I do have a bit of a, a scientific interest, so I was curious to know how to resolve this issue. Yeah. Um, but my only training as such is um, for many years I've been dragging bodies of animals off road. That was the closest I ever got to them. So this was a whole new experience. So basically it wasn't that hard to really do once you stepped over that initial line of dosing and you got comfortable with what happens, um, yeah, anyone could do it, basically. Yeah. How extraordinary. What a, what a change. So how much time do you spend uh, hunting for wombats, trading wombats? Um, probably most weekends I'll have at least a day or half a day where I might be involved with doing something. Um, these days we get a lot of um, landowners around my area who are quite willing to participate and... Um, I'm happy to go out and make assessments, set up uh, infrared cameras to um, see what the animals are doing and give advice. But we do encourage... I, I, there's a lot to be done, so I don't have time to do it, but I do encourage the landowners to do uh, a lot. And a lot of people do want to do it themselves, actually, so yeah. it's quite, quite positive. It's become, by the sound of it, a bit of an obsession for you. 
Uh, Why do you yes. laugh, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> well, you could have other... <laughs> there could be worse ones. But, yeah, no, um, that's true. <laughs> no, so it is a bit, of a, a bit of a hobby, I guess you could say. I think it's more than a hobby by the sound of it. I, and, and a noble hobby, if you want to call it a hobby, that's fine. Okay. Absolutely noble. I have, you know, I just, I, it fascinates me that from that one incident, you've, you've sort of gone on to do what you're doing with it as yeah. regularly as you're doing it. Um, there's, there's a certain passion there. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Nick, uh, how do people get in touch with you or find out more about uh, Mange Management Incorporated? Um, we have a website, which is um, mangemanagement.org.au, mm-hmm. and we have contact details there, and we have a online form there where you can submit a sighting of a wombat. Um, we have about 30 or 40 pick-up points around Victoria, so people can actually pick up the kits themselves and um, start dosing. Um, and we have about a dozen or so people around the state who are able to come out and make assessments if required anyway. All right. Nick, uh, thank you for your time. Fascinating to talk to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, Nick Bean, Mange Management Incorporated President, and uh, how, how it's fascinating, riding his bike, saw a wombat, ended up treating it, and from there uh, has become very passionate about this. Mind you, if uh, what Nick is saying, I'm not saying it's not right, but... It, 30 to 50 years, if it's left untreated because of mange, we could be without a viable population of wombats where they can't breed their numbers back up again because of the genetic uh, situation, the gene pool that would be left if nothing is done. So it's nice to know that people like Nick are actually out there doing stuff because it would not be very nice to be without wombats. I don't think I've always had a bit of a soft spot for them. Three minutes to the news at 7 o'clock. The Country Hour.